um, Vice Chair Brittany Cummins, I think we're ready to go or should I give it another minute? No, I think we're ready. Okay, let's dive in. Uh, thank you for the break. We're moving right along. Um, at this time, uh, we'll move to our September nine enrollment counts. Uh, Deputy Superintendent Jones, going to take point on that? Chair, yes, thank you. Um, Deputy Superintendent of Operations, Scott Jones. Uh, for board members and the public, this is a continuation of our information item from last month related to our September 9 enrollment count estimates. So Angie, we go to the next slide for the timeline, please. Uh, should be timeline, there you go. So if you'll recall, uh, we went over this particular slide that this is the timeline we're on. Obviously today is October 1 and October 1 uh, every year uh, starts the official um, head counts or counts of our students uh, that process. Uh, in a moment here, I'll show you the details of what that entails, what the process entails. So I just want to make sure it's very clear uh, that the September 9th counts, uh, you know, starting on the left here, so uh, of the timeline, were unofficial. Um, we went through those with you, and today I'll drill down a little bit further uh, with the board on what the results were of those September 9th unofficial counts by LEA. Uh, so Angie, if you'll go to the next slide, these were our key considerations for your review, just as an update, and then go to the next slide. Okay, on this slide here, I just wanna make sure there, there seems to have been a mis somewhat of a misunderstanding out there, so I wanna make sure that we're clear on this as well. What this is, is, is the September 9th counts, remember unofficial, was a comparison of where we were at enrollment-wise on September 9th of 2020, so, uh, I'm sorry, on September 9th of 2019, so last school year, September 9th of 2019, we were at 667940. When we took this unofficial poll on September 9th of this year, September 9th of 2020, we were at 665790. So that's a, a decrease of 2,150. So by way of comparison of the time we were at last year to this year, we are only down 2,150 students. Now, all 2,150 students is important. Uh, and, you know, we're, again, you know, we, we provided some information on why we think that there was this difference. But if you were to compare us to other states, other states' enrollments are down in the tens of thousands. So I just want to make sure that we're clear that by way of this unofficial count, we, we, it's indicated that we were only down 2,150 students by way of compar comparison of a particular date from year to year. So Angie, if you go to the next slide, please. So this number, the 9,002, was a projected number that we'd made last fall as part of the Common Data Committee process. So we're not down 9,002 students for enrollment or actual enrollment by way of comparison year to year. We're just off on our enrollment prediction for school year 2020 uh, or for school year 2021. Um, so, you know, hopefully that's clear. So 2150, again, September 9th is an unofficial count is the number that we were down by way of comparison on particular dates year to year. Uh, one other thing, if you could go to the private and homeschool slide, Angie. All these other slides that she's going past right now are um, all the same. There was some questions about um, the update, or I'm sorry, questions about homeschool and private school transitions. So we've tried to clarify that a little bit better by updating this particular slide. So this particular slide here is updated to show that the number of students who transferred to homeschool by way of the unofficial September 9th count is indicating that it more than tripled in the beginning of this year, of school year 2021. On the right side, the number of students who transferred to private schools increased by 50% or more in the beginning of year of school year 21 compared with previous years. So prior years with, with previous years. So we, we're trying to clarify that a little bit better. So um, if you could go back to the first slide to the timeline, Angie, please. 
So again, you know, we're in the October point or the October part of the timeline where we started the October uh, one official counts. Um, so Chair, I'm gonna pause here and see if there's any questions or concerns by board members on what clarifications I try to make or the update to the private and homeschool student slides. But before we do that, if Angie could pull up the even more detailed explanation to help answer any questions on that, I'd appreciate that. So Angie, will you go to that? So changing student enrollment plans, how LEAs update exit codes when students' plans change over the summer break. Because there was a lot of, you know, there were some questions about, well, how does this work, right? So throughout each school year, LEAs track and update exit codes. And, you know, I can't say enough about how well or how great of a job our LEAs do. And so the accuracy of the counts, and as we know, I'll know how important these are. Um, I just, I just want to once again echo my deepest gratitude to them for all the great work that they do. So if we'll just take a minute, I won't read this word for word, but um, so yeah, if you could, well, actually, if you could just pause right there with the chart there. Yeah, so as of this, oh, yep, there you go. As of the September 9th data poll, the cumulative total transfers to homeschool for school year 20 is 3,995. And again, you know, this September 9th was an in informal, unofficial poll, but we were anticipating, because if you recall when I, I briefed you last month, we were anticipating that, um, oh, how come we went out of that? Sorry about that, Scott. I had a request to make it full screen, and I was I was okay. doing something well intentioned, very well intentioned, <laughs> oh. <laughs> to make it easier for people to see. I apologize. No, you're um, fine. Let me yeah, go back to yeah. that document, and yeah, that's great. I'll get there. Is it this one? It's this one. Uh, no. Yes. Yes. You're right. Yeah. Okay. All right. So if you could. Go up a little bit. I mean, on my screen, I needed you to go up to the paragraph above the chart that you're on right now. Right. So, so I was reading this, you know, that as of the September 9th data poll, that's the paragraph right above the chart, those cumulative transfers. Now, if board members will recall, last month I said we don't anticipate the official October 1 counts to change very much from the unofficial September 9 counts. But we do anticipate some change. And especially in this particular area, the transfers to homeschool, we do anticipate that there might be somewhat of an increase in there but once we get to the official October 1 data, or once we um, finalize that October 1 data. So if you could scroll down a little bit further, Angie because we want to just talk to you real quick about the private school. So same thing, you know, or related to the September 9th data poll. We anticipate that there will be some change in the private school enrollments as well. Um, so with that, um, I'll just pause chair and see if there's any questions about the update to the briefing from last month. Uh, hopefully we were able to answer or, or provide a little bit more detail or clarity on the um, private school and homeschool trends, if you will. So any questions or concerns with anything so far in the presentation, Chair? And, um, thank you, Deputy, Deputy Superintendent Jones. Um, Board Member Lear has a question or comment. I do, thank you. Um, and I'm not, I hope, had the sudden thought that maybe I asked this before. So if I did, tell me, um, but, in your numbers on private schools and homeschools, homeschooler increases. Uh, I'm wondering, and it, maybe it doesn't matter. I know you're only trying to give us a snapshot, but but I'm wondering where you get those numbers. I and and then I have a follow up to that. Go ahead, Chair Huntsman. I'd like to Scott. Uh, yeah, Scott. Yeah, I, if Aaron uh, Broff could. Uh, jump in on this. He, he can answer the question on the method. I believe that that's what board member Lear is asking for. Really, is yeah. the method of how we do this. Okay, Aaron Bruff. Yeah, Aaron Bruff, um, data and statistics. Yes, we get these numbers from students who are who were enrolled 
in the public education system, so in a district or a charter school, and then exited the system. And with that exit, they, the student or the parents indicated that they would be transferring to a private school or to homeschool. So these numbers, we're not doing a census or a, a query to you know, the general public saying who's homeschool. These come directly from the LEAs. Um, as they submit the information saying they we had them at the end of the school year and then they have exited from our system to another system. Does that answer your question? It, there's exit codes that LEAs use when they lose a student and so they log them. I, I had a follow-up and everybody's echoing. I had follow-up and everybody's echoing and I'm not sure if it's me or them but um, my follow-up is, um, but if they don't, um, if if people don't give them, if parents don't give uh, their previous school the information, which they don't have to, and or if you don't collect information from all hundred and almost eighty LEAs, then we're just going on what you have. Is that which I, I I'm just concerned is not uh, a necessarily accurate. It's as good as we've got, but it's not, I'm concerned it's not a really accurate number. With that, am I misunderstanding, Aaron? So th that is correct. It is the information that we have within our system. It is not a full picture of everyone who is homeschooled because homeschools don't submit information to us. Private schools don't submit the information to us. So we don't have the full picture of, of how many students are homeschooled, like you said, this is what the LEAs okay. have on exit status. All right, thank you. That's, I just wanted to see if there was something I was missing. Thank you. Other, other questions, comments from board members? Not seeing any other hands raised. And again, this is really important informational information because there's there's some pluses and minuses, there's some funding challenges that are associated with it. And this transparency is is really important. And also what's really important is as uh, Deputy Superintendent Jones stated, that um, other other states have got a lot of kids, a lot of students that um, they don't know where they're at and and our report is pretty good and, it, and again i want to echo where deputy superintendent jones was with our leas you know uh, mr john arthur our teacher of the year was part of this too you know just out find finding students uh, making sure they're they're engaged in public education and then a lot of our educators and um, PTAs and other people are, are making sure that we're getting our kids back in our system during this pandemic, which is refreshing to me. We're, we're still down a, down a few and we're not sure exactly where they're at, but the pursuit is still there uh, to make sure we locate as many as our students as possible. And so I, I'm, I'm somewhat uh, pleased with the numbers that I'm seeing, um, but I, I know there's still more work that needs to be done. Board Member Earl. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Um, yes. Question has to do with, have we taken into, or do we have any idea what the numbers are for um, maybe the influx of um, relocations to the state of Utah? I know it's hard for um, homes, at least in my area and other areas around me, are they're only on the market for a few weeks before they're sold and uh, a number of them are coming from out of state. Um, are you are you aware of any data or numbers as far as the increase in population itself in specific areas? I'm just curious if we are getting some of that report too. Chair Huntsman, this is Scott. I can answer that question. Yes, please. Uh, Board Member Earl, uh, ma'am, we'll, we'll have that more in detail after we get the, or we'll be able to answer that question when we get the official October 1 counts. So at your November meeting, I'd be able to, to really, you know, provide meaningful data on that question. But we really need the official October 1 counts to come in. Does that help answer your question, ma'am? 
Yeah, sure. And I wondered, I, maybe that's when you meet with at the legislature too, or to start looking at projections. I guess they would have numbers of uh, families that have moved into the state of Utah, right? And and then there would be some um, information on that as well. And you're right. speaking about the common data group. Yes, right. that, that is what I'm referring to. Yes, yes ma'am. And, and so we have some very good economists um, that come in and, and as part of the CDC process, will generate that information out that you're asking for that everybody, that, you know, we're all interested in knowing. Now, our first CDC meeting is scheduled for October 5th. There's a series of about four meetings. So, you know, again, we'll, we'll be able to provide you and other board members and the public more information on that specific question and all the other questions when these official counts come in. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so, Chair Huntsman, are there any other questions or I'm concerns at this time? Because I'll segue to just a little bit more detail on the official October 1 counts. Yes, please continue. I'm not seeing any of their hands raised. Great, so on September 21st, I sent out this memo to uh, our superintendents, charter school directors, and their respective business administrators. So within the timeline that we showed you or briefed you, this is the next really important step, and that's these official October 1 counts. So here within this letter, and it's in your backups, right? So, you know, and I won't read it for word for word, but basically, um, so Angie, if you could scroll down, uh, it, it, it's on the second page, I believe. Right, so, uh, yep, right there, Tuesday, October tw uh, 13th. You can go back up to those, or back down to those bold dates, whichever way, and I'll be up, I guess, yeah. So, right, so, the following are this year's deadlines for the four record or record October 1 data submissions. So Tuesday, October 13th is when we complete the finalized update of, U of the Utrex data. Utrex is our system as of October 1st, right? So as of today, or when we get to October 13th, we'll finalize what the LEA submitted of what, you know, their students look like on October 1st. OK, so even then, after October 13th, we still need more time to evaluate and, and review the data. Um, it, the idea, though, is that, um, you know, we'll have everything ready or start the process with you, the board, uh, in your November meeting to um, get to what right is as far as, you know, distribution or what we will or will not do with funding. And that will all take place as part of that common data committee process. So the timing of this is really important. So then we'll have your November meeting for decision-making purposes and your December meeting for decision-making purposes. But it all relies on this official Tuesday, October 13th deadline that gives us the as of October 1st um, look, the official look of, of, our, of our enrollments. Um, with that, Angie, could you exit out? And I wanna show you what, where we're at based on our unofficial September 9th counts. So if you look at these unofficial September 9th counts, and you can see that by the indicators are definite that there was a, a significant migration into online programs. The LEAs you see at the top of this chart are all um, capable of or provide that that particular learning environment. So we did see, again, you know, it's still unofficial, but we did, and this substantiates with those counts that we did see migration into those particular LEAs or online programs. And then as you as we scroll down, you can see the different, um, you know, increases in enrollment or decreases in enrollment, starting with, you know, you hit the zero percent or even out, and the number of students as we scroll all the way down. So if you go all the way down to the bottom, Angie, you know, yeah, then, you know, board members will be able to see. So at the bottom of this chart, you can see in blue were charter schools that opened for the first time this year in one charter school capstone that closed. So, you know, that's at the bottom of the detail. And you can see that this correlates with our 2,150 number, you know, 
comparing September 9th to September 9th of last year. Well, what's the so what of this? The so what of this is, is we'll compare the unofficial September 9th counts with the record counts and again, provide you those details and trends and, you know, for further analysis and decision making as we move together through this, you know, challenging circumstance of the impacts on enrollment or, you know, transitions or uh, choices into different learning environments in your November and December meetings so that we, we arrive at a consensus on what's best for the funding uh, impact, you know, how, how best to fund, if you will, not only for this budget year, but next budget year. And then, of course, in close cooperation with the legislature as part of the 2000, uh, the 21 legislative session. Uh, so with that, Chair Huntsman, um, this concludes this information item subject to any additional questions or concerns by any of our board members. Thank you, Scott. Um, board member Belknap got her hand raised. Thank you, Chair. Scott, I have a couple of questions on what you said. So you, on the chart right before this, when you had that things needed to be in on September 29th by five o'clock, I don't really understand that. And two, the count on October 3rd is still dependent on what's there on October 1st, correct? Deputy Superintendent Jones. Scott, are you with us? Yes, Chair, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, sorry. Let me let me ask Aaron Bruff to um, provide the detail or the to answer uh, Board Member Belknap's first question on that Tuesday, September 29th deadline. Okay, Aaron Bruff. Aaron Bruff, uh, date and statistics. So September 29th, really what it was is we had a September 15th um, data submission that we were looking at or a September, uh, sorry, September 9th when we were looking at it. And then we had the uh, uh, storm come through in Northern Utah, which knocked out power for lots of uh, LEAs and such, including the, uh, the State Board of Education. And so we moved that deadline back um, to get that information. That's what happened there. Okay. Um, Can I just follow up on that, Aaron? Yes. Okay. Follow thanks, up. Chair. Thanks, Chair. Um, so I, I have a question because I'm seeing a lot of movement today between um, online virtuals, um, charters, and traditional districts moving right now. How does that count happen when it's they move today? So if I can answer. Yes, please. So when we say today, the October one count is a snapshot of to today. Where is the student enrolled today? So if they were in a traditional district brick and mortar school yesterday, but then they transfer to an online school today, when we do the October counts, they will be on the in the online school because it's looking at that point in time or this day, today. So if there's movement today. What if, if they're, they're both today? So if they're if they're dual enrolled. No, 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 no. When I say dual enrolled, okay. what I mean by that, sorry, is so they move, they're still enrolled in the other place, and now they're enrolled in the new the new location. We do receive both information or both records. Um, of them, we obviously will start looking at where do they have um, the most enrollment records and such. And so we do go through a tiebreaker. All of that will be finalized at the end of year when we get the, the total summation, where was the students at? And we apply the, um, the proration rules that Scott will be talking about in our next um, um, item 17, I think, the next part of the agenda items. Does that make sense? So, Clarity, can, thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Aaron. And, and board member Belknap, most likely, and we had this challenge in finance several years ago where this all came, came to the surface and how do you referee and how does the dollar go to the right place? And most likely with some changes and, and things that we see this round, 
or, or we're seeing experiencing right now a most likely the discussion will be, end up being back into finance the way i'm i'm just predicting um some of the challenges that will be before us so we'll we'll watch and and then address it in the future so thank you chair thank you so chair Huntsman, this is scott again yeah. um you know uh, are there any other Questions from board members, or and, and I, I believe we answered board member Belknap's questions. So, are there any other questions or concerns? I'm not. I'm not seeing any other hands raised. Um, board member Belknap, your hand's still up, but I, I don't want to pick on you. Um, I'm not seeing any. Does this conclude your September 9th enrollment count information? Yes, sir. Concluded. Okay, so this will, we'll just, this will, uh, we'll just keep this alive as we're, as we're moving through the school year. So I appreciate the update, and and again, we're very mindful of the, the uh, flow chart there with the calendar. So thank you. So let's uh, now move to our next item, and Deputy Superintendent Scott Jones, you're on that. That's uh, our leg legislative session preparation we're going to be talking about adm which is our average daily um, membership and this has got a proposed action attached to it so please continue scott uh yes chair um before we get too far into this i do want to just uh point out that uh you know patrick uh, lee our school finance director and jay cowtrow are uh MSP coordinator will present this today. What we're asking for from the board is just permission. Um, so here's what the so what of this agenda item is. Everyone will recall that the COVID-19 issue or situation occurred and affected last school year. Uh, if everyone recalls, you know, it was roughly around March 16th that we went to what was titled the soft closure. And so there was great concern about average daily membership. Uh, the board just did a phenomenal job of um, addressing it. The staff are on it. What this is is just a um, proposal to the board to give us permission to use this methodology as part of the upcoming CDC process. It does not mean that it will be the final method. We have to reach consensus on how to compute or get to an ADM number. So we're just asking for the board to, because of the unique circumstance we're in, and because we're funded on ADM and growth, that this may be an, a methodology that we can apply given the circumstances that occurred last school year. Um, we just felt strongly that board members and the public would need to know that, you know, when the CDC process starts off, we need a lot of um, different ways or methods the, to use to get to what right is uh, with funding for our LEAs. Uh, you know, especially there's a lot of concern about next school year, you know, or state fiscal year 22 on, you know, what funding levels will be out for average daily membership. So I just wanted to pause here uh, before I ask you permission, Chair, to turn it over to Patrick and Jake to say, we're not asking the board to, to approve that this would be the only method that we use but that we would be allowed to um, insert, if you will, or have the CDC look at this method because of the situation that occurred last school year, that being, you know, what amounted to about 35 days of the 180 days where, you know, the soft closure process occurred. So chair with that, if I may, um, or with your permission, I'd like to turn it over to school finance director, Patrick Lee and MSP coordinator, Jake Cowtrow. Patrick and and Jake, you're you're up, and thank you, thank you, Scott, for introducing this uh, opportunity for us. Uh, thank you, Chair Huntsman. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Okay. Just want to double check that. So, School Finance Director Patrick Lee and uh, Jake will come in later in the presentation. But as Deputy Superintendent Scott Jones mentioned, uh, this presentation is on the average daily membership, the ADM proration methodology review for school year 1920, which as the board is aware, um, 
with uh, which feeds into the funding related to the current year uh, using the prior year ADM plus growth. And so the significant nature of that, you can tell. So uh, let's go to the next slide, Angie. Okay, so what I want to start with is kind of recapping um, what happened back in March and the board's waiver just a, a refresher on this kind of as the basis of where we started for this calculation. So going back to board rule 277419 with the soft closure of many of, of many or most of the schools in March earlier this year, um, the board saw it important to be able to uh, address that situation and the effects that would result from those closures on funding and in the student uh, membership calculation. So reading through uh, this waiver, notwithstanding the requirements of section seven and eight, the superintendent shall calculate an LEA's membership for days of instruction from March 16th, 2020 to June 30th, 2020, based on the LEA's average rate of membership between July 1, 2019 and March 13th, 2020, if the LEA has submitted a continuity of education plan on or before June 1, 2020, and the LEA provides educational services through the end of the LEA's regular school, ca school year calendar. And so in, in looking at this waiver that the board provided and understanding the intent was to hold harmless the LEAs for this situation, uh, we engaged in uh, several different discussions to ensure that the calculation reflected what the board's intent was with this waiver. So if we can move to the next slide. So there's been, uh, some of this has been touched on so far and there's a lot of information in this slide in particular, but what I really want to point out to, to the board members is the steps that were taken to review this process to ensure by all parties um, that that everything was being done to, to make sure that the, the situation that occurred was reflected in the calculation that, that was being done and that membership was calculated appropriately to adjust for the, the COVID-19 situation. So in meeting with the governor's office of management and budget, the legislative fiscal analysts, as well as business administrators from LEAs, um, we, we work together as well with data and statistics and financial operations to ensure that we were getting to the right calculation for membership. So what this slide shows is the COVID proration and different steps. So you have steps, uh, four steps altogether related to the COVID proration itself. However, step one is what would occur in any normal given year, um, whether there was the COVID situation or not. That's what happens as the LEAs have finalized all of their data in the Utrecht system, and then that's copied over to the USBE data warehouse. So this step occurs no matter what year it is. However, steps two, three, and four are what uh, relate to the COVID proration. So step one is done, but step two, three, and four are adjusted for the COVID situation and ensuring that we're properly counting what has happened during the school closures. Um, and if there are questions on this, we can, we can come back to this slide at a later time. Um, I think Aaron Bruff might be able to answer some of those a little better. Um, what we'd like to do now is to try and give an example of, of what this proration looks like in the next slide. So I'll turn the time over now to Jake Houtrow, our MSP administrator, who will review that uh, proration example with the board. Yes, thank you, Patrick. I'm going to walk through this um, proration example of two students um, that will detail essentially what step what takes place in step two on the previous slide. Uh, so we can take a school with two students. Uh, you could call it an LEA with two students even. Um, step one, you would determine the membership from school year 2019-2020 before the soft closure took place and calculate a ratio uh, for student A, let's say they had 90 actual membership days from July through March until the soft closure. Uh, and student B, they had, a, they had 145 days of membership until the closure. 
Um, you take the, the actual membership days divided by the school days before the closure um, as a denominator and uh, you calculate the ratio for student A, 62%, for student B, 100%. Um, step two, you apply the ratio um, in order to calculate prorated membership days. Uh, so there's 180 max membership days in statute and by rule. So we apply the ratio to that 180 days to get the prorated uh, membership. Um, that would be 111 membership uh, days prorated for student A and 180 uh, membership days prorated for student B. And stop me if there are any questions or anything on this. I tried to make it as simple as possible. Um, from step two to step three, uh, or in step three, that's where we determine the ADM or the average daily membership, and that's total membership days uh, divided by the hundred divided by 180 days. And again, that's a statutory calculation. Uh, so, uh, for comparison, total actual membership for school uh, for these two students in that school from July through March, 235 days. That's again before the closure. Um, total membership for that school. Um, prorated uh, is 291. Uh, to get ADM, you divide those by 180. So the non-prorated ADM would be 1.31 and the prorated ADM would be 1.62, um, which is 24% increase. Um, so essentially what the proration is doing is capturing 24% uh, more uh, membership days that would have pretty much otherwise been missed. Um, I guess one other note that I can make uh, make is that because we are bringing in uh, July through March 2020, July 2019 through March 2020 uh, membership data from Utrex, some students may actually have greater than 145 day membership days. Uh, the sequel that pulls this membership, however, uh, compensates for this um, it be, uh, by capping the ratio at 100%. So, for example, a student with 150 membership days through from July through March would be uh, at 100% of 145 instead of um, 150 divided by 145 or 103%. I hope that makes sense. Um, so that's hopefully a, a simplified version of what we're doing, but I think it accurately captures uh, what's happening um, with the membership uh, that, we're, that we're calculating and the ADM. Uh, secondly, uh, I, if there are any questions on the on the proration example, I can take them now. Um, otherwise, we can move on to the to the next slide. I'm not seeing any hands raised, but thank you for a really good explanation here. So please continue. Yeah, no problem. No, thank you, Chair Husband. Uh, so this slide essentially a detail of what is happening in the board backup. Um, I believe it's the K through 12 WPUs. Um, COVID proration example. I, I don't necessarily have the exact title of that document, but it's an Excel spreadsheet. Well, PD, I guess you have it in PDF. Um, essentially, it's a comparison between WP, WPUs or total WPUs from legislative estimates, the projections that we did um, early on in the fiscal, uh, early on in this calendar year versus the mid-year estimates um, that are using the COVID prorated uh, membership or ADM as well as the unofficial September 9th survey, survey data. data. Uh, for kindergarten, the WPU estimates um, from projections, sorry, I have my, a dog making a little bit of noise in the background because of some sirens. Um, so for kindergarten, the WPU estimates from projections to September 9th poll dropped 1.53% for districts, but there was an increase in charters of 4.19% in program funding on the kindergarten side. Uh, grades one through 12, it was a similar increase for both charters and districts um, in, in terms of funding. Um, and if, if you have that uh, comparison handy, you'll see there's quite a bit of variation from, uh, from LEA to LEA. Uh, for example, Wasatch, Wasatch School District showed a 56% increase in kindergarten, 25% increase in grades one through 12, and there's similarly a big variance, variance in a chart in Utah Connections Academy. Uh, so that wraps up uh, my portion of the presentation. I'll be happy to take any questions. And if not, we can uh, turn the time back over to Patrick Lee. Chair Huntsman, if it's okay, I can uh, wrap up on this uh, summary okay. slide. Here. I'm not seeing any hands raised. So okay. Please continue, Patrick. Hey, thank you, sir. Um, so to, to summarize the process and, and what we're trying to accomplish here and, and needing the board's approval on, so the, with the COVID-19 impact in Utah schools resulting in the soft closure 
of the schools during the latter part of that school year, um, the board took the action as, as mentioned and as we reviewed earlier in providing the waiver during that soft closure time period. Um, the, there were concerns that were immediately raised as to how USB staff would respond to those soft closures, particularly as it related to funding and average daily membership, of course, the, those calculations translates into the funding and the, the related WPUs. Um, in, in, doing, in doing this, USB staff, uh, we worked uh, very closely with business administrators, with the fiscal analyst office, with the governor's office, uh, in order to ensure that membership levels accurately reflect what happened during the year and taking into account that special time period of the school closures. Now data and statistics are in the process of finalizing membership data and, and will be with, um, uh, or excuse me, have uh, with the, the October 1 counts. We'll be working on this, finalizing membership data from LEAs from the year in submissions and incorporating that COVID-19 proration. Now, at this point, we do need the board's approval to be able to move forward with using this proration and calculating the FY20 ADM and the resultant WP level, WPU levels that will affect the funding for LEAs. But going back to what Deputy Superintendent Scott Jones had mentioned, uh, the use of this COVID-19 proration will be contingent upon discussion with stakeholders in the, the upcoming CDC process. So there may be changes that need to be made to this methodology or adjustments along the way to make sure that we're fully reflecting what occurred during the school closure. Um, Chair Huntsman, that's all that we have for this presentation. Um, if there are any questions, we can uh, respond to those at this time. Thank you. And I just might add that sometimes these methodologies and these formulas and that end up being in our system and they've, they've been in the past and people have said, this is for our board members to know this and say, well, how did that come about? Where did that come from? How did, and so staff, you know, it's really important for them as they're moving forward in this process, um, have some kind of record or some kind of approval uh, from our board um, as they move into this space of, it's not really a negotiation, but as, as a, uh, as a, we need to bring, they need to bring a methodology um, before the CDC as they're moving forward. So that, so this is all open and transparent and not something that just happened and without our fingerprints on it. So that's why this is on the agenda. Is, do you have anything to add to that, Deputy Superintendent Jones? Uh, no, sir. Uh, Patrick and Jake covered it well. Uh, you did, you did as well in the summary, other than just to say, um, I know that this is a lot to take in. Uh, we're doing our level best to, you know, I, I feel like, you know, time is still on our side and that by doing this in, you know, incremental steps, board meeting to board meeting, we'll get to what right is by our LEAs and the resourcing that needs to happen. Uh, you know, I don't know, just as anybody else does, you know, how much longer this COVID situation is going to last what the impacts will be. What I do know though, is that we will stand by our LEAs, our, you know, our educators and our students and provide the most meaningful data that we possibly can to you as USB board members for decision-making purposes. So sir, with that, it, it, unless there's any other questions or concerns from board members, um, that concludes this particular agenda item within the overall agenda item. So at the conclusion of this, I, I guess what would be happening is that uh, we would be seeking a motion that the board approve the methodology as presented for average daily membership, oh, excuse me, that the board approve the methodology for average daily membership as presented. Is there any board members wanna make a motion or a so moved? So moved, Cindy Davis. Uh, thank you, Board Member Davis. Is there a second? Board Member Haynes. Board Member Haynes. Okay. But I'm hearing lots, lots of seconds. There. Any, any further discussion? Um, seeing none, the motion before the board is to approve the methodology for average daily membership as presented. At this board, at this time, board members, please vote.
I'm I'm not seeing where board member Marsh or board member Bolters voted yet. Are you still on with us? Board member Marsh? Are you still part of him? Yeah, there we go. The voting is complete and the motion passes unanimously. Thank you, board members.